Welcome everybody to today's sit down. It is a very rare occasion you get to sit next to a living legend. My friend next to me has been involved in so many things. He is a TV presenter, radio presenter. He is a producer, an entrepreneur, a restauranteur, and he is the voice of reason every afternoon on the scenic drive. Mr. Jan van Eerden, welcome to our show, sir. Thank you, sir. Good to see you, and uh, thank you for your wonderful introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. You need to speak at my funeral, Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd rather, I'd rather <laughs> praise people while they're still around, no. sir, because you really, really deserve that. Thank you. Everybody that I speak to absolutely loves and adores you. They love your fire. They love your passion. They love the fact that you're not afraid to speak your mind. You're very direct. And if it offends some people, then, you know, at least it's your truth. Yeah. And as long as you stay to your truth, then everything's fine. You know what's weird to me? Um, I think in my old age, people have gotten young used age. to you're me. Young age, you're very young. <laughs> people have, <laughs> Please. People, people have gotten used to me. You know, I remember when I, when I took over the breakfast show at Jacaranda FM for the first time. Right at the beginning, there was a, a cartoon in the newspaper um, with a tree, a Jacaranda tree with my face on it. On the one side, you had people with uh, water cans and, um, uh, you know, buckets of water uh, saying, water him, give him water. Okay. The other side, people with chainsaws and axes going, chop him out. So that, that's where I was at the beginning. And it was odd to me that now, after, after all these years, it's like, you know, after, after all the BCCSA complaints, and all the times I had to, um, had to go and explain myself, it's all in the past now for some reason. So I've got an opinion of, of the, the water and the chain, so if I may, please, mm. sir. So the only way to get to the truth is opposing opinions. You're not afraid to bring somebody in and talk to him that you don't necessarily agree with, and you'll challenge him. And out of that, the truth comes out. So mm. you haven't made it this far in your career if you weren't a synergist. So you'll challenge someone, but you want the truth to come out, and yeah. it's your truth. Yeah. The thing to me is, and I, I always tell my kid as well, is truth to me is above all the most important human quality that you can have. Same here. That you can possess. Don't, please don't lie to me. You can do anything, but don't lie to me. Yeah. And it's, it's just like one of those things that just irks me so much. And I am a, an ardent supporter and uh, enthusiast when it comes to truth. And, and, you know, whatever your truth is, and, and your truth and my truth might be different, as long as you stick to it and you have an opinion that's based on facts. Yes. You actually went and researched something. And I think that's a, that's a major problem that we've got. People have opinions for, uh, about everything that happens in the country, but they don't have the facts. They don't have the facts. Our company culture is, is, is quite strong. In the automotive industry, I believe... Our company culture is one of the strongest and the reason for that is we've got a rule it's it's a rule that 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 will never be broken if you follow this system you will always come out better and the system is facts and debate and truth always overpowers rank mm. so if for example the wash bay manager comes to me and says this is actually not not if this happened. He said to me, Bobby, we are parking the cars this way. I feel if we park the cars this way and create this flow, we can wash between two and four cars extra per hour. I said to him, wow, that's that's brilliant observation. Can we try? Yes. He tried it for two days. I called the whole company and I said, listen, up to now, this is the way we park the cars. We could only wash X amount of cars. Jimmy figured out a better way. Let's give him a hand. Thank you very much, Jimmy. You continue what you're doing. We're very proud to have you on our team. So the truth is, I didn't go and impose his opinion on the people. You know, I seek advice and then give praise because mm. the truth was from his side, not from mm. my side. Exactly. The way I find myself now um, in the businesses that we've got is I have to be guided by people that um, I've appointed because of their experience and their knowledge. So uh, I, you, we cannot know everything. 
Uh, How we can we we can we we bosses for a reason because we know how to bring out the best in people. There we go. An effective executive plays to his strengths and to his staff's strengths. No. Yeah. So if you're strong at at organizing people together, don't you can't be strong in accounting. You have to play an accountant's strength in that position. Otherwise, you will never have a complete full circle. Yeah. Amen to that. Thank you, sir. I want to ask you my favorite question. Mm. One of them. If we can close our eyes and if it was possible and we went boom and we look at you as a businessman and I mean, you, you've you done it all and you your work ethic is here. But if we could go back into time and bring the 17 year old version of you. So you're 17, you're in high school. What are you thinking about? What's your priorities? Who who is Rian at 17? Who were you at high school? I was someone that um, recreated myself. Uh, when I was, uh, when I just started high school, I, I thought, all right, um, I'm going to have to do something. I'm a bit of a recluse. I spent most of my time reading and writing. Beautiful. Um, and not really interacting with people. So I thought there's going to be uh, one career choice for me here. I continue living like this and that's probably going to be serial killer <laughs> so I thought alright okay, I wasn't expecting that <laughs> I'm going to I'm so, going to need I'm going to need to do something about okay, myself let's course correct a little <laughs> bit here. we're not going there <laughs> so uh, thank you sir for so, deciding to yeah, change direction nah, yes pleasure. thank you very much I, thought it, I also thought it was the better many way. people thank you not only me. <laughs> so I uh, I decided alright let me do uh, orators, let, let me get on a stage and, and see. I have to force myself, but let's let's see how it works for me. So, I ended up. Um, I heard there were uh, there was an English orators competition. Okay. And I said, all right, so I'll, I'll enter. And I remember that that day very well. There were three of us, literally three people participating. Yeah, those are good odds. Yeah, yeah, yeah those, those are good odds. And there were about ten people in the hall. Okay, a pretty really good ten. crowd. <laughs> so I came third. Beautiful. And um, I had a certificate that said you came third. Beautiful. You know, it's not important how many other people participated. Of course. And I hung that thing over my bed and I, I looked at it every day and I said to myself, you did it. You came third in an orator's competition. You never did this before. So I started recreating myself and I started more and more participating in stuff where I, were, I challenged myself, my, my inner being, my very essence. So, I, uh, you know, and every time I just increased it, every time I would speak to bigger and bigger crowds or in front of bigger and bigger crowds. You know, it's people's biggest fear, talking in front of crowds. Absolutely. So, I'm, you know, even my wife is like, if people only knew what an introvert you are, I, I, perfect day for me is in my office alone, like doing my thing alone. But on a Monday morning at 7 a.m., I stand in front of 200 people and I give training. It's so, it, the first couple of times I wanted to quit, I, I said, no, I'm not going to train people. I'll get someone else to do it. But I want to do it in my way. And, and you know, I want to drive this culture that I believe will ultimately make a lot of people win. It's the scariest thing I do every single day is to speak in front of people. Exactly. So when I was 17, um, I thought... I want to be a politician. That's my thing. And I saw that all the other politicians at the time were, um, they, they studied law. Yes. And I thought, okay, so I'm going to, I can see myself as a politician, so I'm going to study law. So I, at 17, I um, was the guy that every time there was an opportunity to speak in front of the school, I would jump at it. Um, and every time it, it would, the, the crowds would be bigger. So I thought, uh, yeah, see, this is great. This is just fantastic. I've got this captive audience. And they have to sit there. Yes. They have to they listen have to, to yeah. me. You know, even if it was the smallest announcement. Um, it's a great like, practice session. The smallest thing. I would say, I'll make, I'll do it. I'll make the announcements. Um, so I prepared myself for a life as a politician. That's what I was doing at 17. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. You know, I've overheard 
in fact, everybody's over it, that you are finally pulling the trigger and you're going to pursue that dream, sir. 2024. Yes, yes. yes. Can't wait. Yeah. Can't so, wait. So to me, um, there's, a few, there's, there's been a few bucket list items. And the thing is, I ran out of bucket list items, my first list. And uh, I remember I was in, in, in uh, Switzerland somewhere, wandering around. And I, I said to myself, I need, I need a new list. So I drew, uh, drafted a new list. And I'm about 70% or 80%, 80% through that list now. Beautiful. So there's still that one thing that keeps on eluding me, and that's the politician. Beautiful. Like, like I say, to me, it doesn't... Uh, uh, you know, Bobby, I hate, hate, hate just complaining and doing nothing. I hate sitting behind a microphone and saying, ah, the government, uh, look what they did now. Yes. Ah, the potholes. Ah, the corruption. Yes. What does it help? Nothing. To sit there and you, complain. You have to actively make changes to help people and to make a difference. If you complain, that's not a change. I never saw a victim when you walked in here. I saw a proud man. Yeah. There's no victim card in, in, no, in no, your no. pocket. No, Absolutely no. not. So if it's just me, if it's just me and, and uh, Cole, my right-hand guy, and my kid, uh, the, that's it. You know, it's fine. But at least I'll, uh, I'll know that I tried at least to Absolutely. do something. So to me, Bobby, getting on a plane and leaving South Africa is not the answer. No. Uh, and I, I can't even say with due respect to those people because... So your option was leaving. Um, and, and it's always the same thing. Ah, oh, it's for the kids. It's for the kids. We all, we, we all have kids. Yeah, yeah. But we go, I, had a, I remember growing up in South Africa, and I remember how it was and how it could be. Could, it could be an amazing country for everybody. Yeah, yes. I just for a selected few back in the yeah, day. Yeah. It can be an amazing country for everybody, and that will be the place you want to you give you want to leave behind for your kids. And, and I mean, you, you are very well traveled. Uh, I've traveled to many countries as well. Every country has got its own. Oh, for, for sure. But, but the thing is, you always, because I, I worked for Greeks for many, many years, many years. And one thing I realized back then was no matter how many generations, like let's say the grandfather came to South Africa or the father, they were always considered as outsiders. Yes. People talk about the Greeks, Adi Grieke. Yeah. They were never included as South Africans. And that is, that is unfortunately, what's going to be happening to South Africans overseas. South Africans overseas. Yes. you always be seen as uh, yeah. this group. This group, yeah. You know? I'm, I'm Bulgarian. So we, our family came to this country. I was eight years old. And my father and my mother left um, Bulgaria. My, my father came here first to look for a better life for us. I mean, he came here with no money, no English. He came here with a dream that he wants a better life for his family because of the communism system that mm, was mm. designed, you, you know, where everybody's equal, but some people are a little bit more equal than others. Mm. And at the time, you know, that didn't make sense to him. So he came here. I love, like, South Africa is the best place on the world. I've been to Las Vegas. I've been everywhere. And when you, when you come here, there's just a buzz. It's, yeah. it's, this oh, is yeah. home. Oh, yeah. It's a beautiful country. So here's the thing. What is a refugee? What is a refugee? Now, we need to understand that concept of refugee, people fleeing their homeland. And like, uh, to your point, communism was a horrific system um, in, enforced on people. And that led to a lot of people going, well, uh, this is not for me. Yeah. So um, no matter what anyone says, it's, we're not a communist state. No, we're not. Um, also, this perception that it's just certain groups affected by crime. Everyone's affected by crime. Absolutely. Everyone is, is, uh, is despondent. Everyone's going, like, I can't survive here. Yeah. Um, we, we need to change things. But not everyone can leave or wants to leave. Yeah. So, to me, it's, it's always been that one thing. Understand that certain people have to run from their countries. Like, now, what's happening? Ukraine. In Ukraine. Ukraine, you um, have to. Syria, as, as an example. Pe people have to f flee uh, Afghanistan. Yeah, I mean, your, your, your hierarchy of needs, your, your number one need is safety. Mm. You, you need to be safe. If you can't, as a, as, a, as a parent, as a brother, as a son, as a father, if you can't protect your, your loved ones, you need, that's your primary job is yeah. to protect your loved ones. And if there's, if there's people bombing us, I'm, I'm getting the hell out of you. Oh, for sure. That, that you don't have a choice. But to me also, so let, let's look at South Africa before and look at South Africa now. So 
the wealthy areas in South Africa, I'm talking about before the elections, 94 elections, were, for instance, Waterkloof in Pretoria. You, went to, you came to Pretoria, there was one area, yeah. Waterkloof. Yeah. Everyone wanted to live in Waterkloof. Yeah. No one could live in Waterkloof, yeah. or most people couldn't live in Waterkloof. Because of the, of the, of the price. Expensive. Yeah. Now look at Pretoria. Look at where we are now. Look at the massive estates where houses go for 15 million rand, it's minimum in mad, some cases. Mad. Um, let's say the houses start at, what, 3.5 to 4 million, yeah. all the way up. Yeah. How many of these estates are in Pretoria? How did that happen? Yeah. Where did those people get the money? Yeah. Where did it come from? Capitalism. So, so what happened was, yes, because of our government's incompetence, businesses have thrived. Uh, the security industry has thrived. Um, now, uh, private electricity suppliers will be thriving soon. Um, uh, look at the post office. Yeah. So someone said, okay, so the post office owes 3.5 billion, whatever the case might be. But because the post office was so inefficient, PostNet started up. And yeah. all sorts of companies where you can just walk in, get a stamp, post a parcel. Yeah. So it for, wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible for every every action. There's a there's a reaction. So sometimes when one when one area fails, it opens up seventeen yeah. other opportunities where more people are employed, yeah. more more economic drive happens, more yeah. more. I understand what you mean. It's very 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 nice angle that you explain it in. The land of opportunity. The land of opportunity. And the thing with South Africa is it's. It's, it's growing. It's, uh, to, your, to your word you used early on, it's buzzing. It's there's buzzing. Buzz. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, at this whole time, there's just things happening. And if you see, there's so many opportunities, so many people willing to work. Look at the cost of our labor. Uh, we, we run a cadetship program. So I want to explain to you what that is. And that's like I'm getting goosebumps. That's my why every day. We get young kids normally from quite rough backgrounds. Mm. Um, you know, the family situation is not great. You know, some of the kids that, that, that enter our Kadecha program leave, you, you know, their houses four o'clock in the morning to be able to come and train with us at seven. You know, they travel by taxis, by bus, by trains. They come, they sit in our training program for three months. After that, we've got a three months proof period. And then, you know, without... A formal education without without a degree without a an an entry point like we we spoke we spoke with mr george mini in fact the last interview was what is a degree it's just an opening to the door but if you have that opportunity to walk into the door so so those people come from a background of like this is i'm going to get stuck in this life and it's going to be me forever but they do have phenomenal work ethic they want to achieve stuff. They want to grow. And then four out of the five top salespeople in our company come through the Kadecha program. Mm. They don't have a degree. Incredible. They Incredible. don't have a matric certificate. But Incredible. South African young people are willing to work. Yeah. They're hardworking. Yeah. They're willing to grow. Yeah. It's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful I, environment. I must tell you, with, now with our... So I have the production company and I have <coughs> the restaurant. And I said to them, when I took over the restaurant, there was um, a lot of concern from the staff. And they said, yes, what's going, you know, what is he going to do? What about us? You know, and they literally, and it was actually quite heartwarming how um, they would ask the customers, for instance, waiters that have they've been there for very long, they would say, can you, if you see him, can you just ask him not to fire me? You know? Oh, wow. So uh, they had this perception of who yeah. you are before they knew yeah. who you are. That, I would get rid of everybody and start again. So I sat down with them and I said to them, you need to understand, as the staff of, of this restaurant, you've been here for much longer than me. I just got you here. Know, <laughs> I just arrived. I, you, know, you know the people that come here better than me. Yeah. Why would I get rid of you now? Of course. But also understand that there's a standard that I will bring in and that you need to meet this standard. And let's, let's give you a few months and see if you can meet the standard. Now, what has happened now is... We now have a staff that, and I also said to them at the beginning, is I, I do not want a house, a palace in Moikloof. Yeah. What am I going to do with it, Bobby? What am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with a Maserati? What am I going to do with a Lamborghini? What am I going to do with yeah. it? To me, everyone has to benefit yes. from the success of the business. Yes. So I said to them, I promise you, 
um, you look after me, I look after you. It's as simple as that. And I want you to thrive. I want you to do better. And, and, and to me, that's the ultimate goal. I want everyone that works for me to be successful and healthy and happy. That's what I want. And, and you, you touched on the standard. I want to just dive a little bit deeper into that with our Kadecha program as well. You're looking, for, you're looking for certain things at certain levels of, of the company, of the restaurant. So, for, for example, a person just coming in, his standard of you, you know, front-facing customers, customer service, may I, thank you very much. Mm. That standard's not been created yet. But what you're looking for here is work ethic. Do you show up early? Are you enthusiastic? Are you smiling? Mm. Are you willing to be helpful? Do you stay late? Mm. If you meet that standard, boom, you can progress. Mm. Then the next level requires a different standard. And the moment that people feel entitled, I have to get this because, and the standard drops, that's when the problems happen and the uncomfortable conversations need to take place. Yeah. Otherwise, the whole company standard drops. Yeah. And then you fail as a, as a leader. Everybody loses their mm. job. Exactly. But for, uh, to me, it's, it's, it's the odd thing um, in South Africa. It's always when people go, um, there's something called minimum wage. So I'm going to pay you minimum wage. And I don't understand that. Like why? And, and, and then even, you know, with domestic workers, where people go, ah, well, now there's a minimum wage. So now I'm, you know, now actually I'm, I'm going to have to let my domestic worker go because I have to pay another 10 rand a day. You know, what kind of people are these? Yeah. Who are you? You, you, you have to, but, but that's the difference between a boss and a leader, in my opinion. Mm. A, a, a leader needs to add value in, in the employee's life. And it always, uh, uh, every single person that starts with me, I'll share a story. His name's Given. Starts in the wash bay. That's, that's how... That's how we progress in our company. Given starts in the wash bay and he's washing cars. Every day he gets a salary. Uh, every day he comes in, washes the cars, mops the floor around him. We've got certain sections and then we rate each and every person manning the section and there's a, a, like a performance bonus. There's, there's always incentives in our company. And all the managers are like, yes, this, this young man is so bright, he's so friendly, he's got a big smile like this. He's a smallish guy and he's, he constantly wins, you know, the best mm. area. Wow. So, so I lock on to him. Given what do you want to be, you know, in this company? I love, I love to just grow. Anyway, spend five, six, seven months coaching him, guiding him. Boom, lands up in the safe, in a safe room, handing out the keys, working a system. Three, four months later, becomes a cadet. So he becomes the, like the right-hand guy, the left-hand guy for the, for the person that's selling the most cars. And six months later, becomes a salesperson. Excellent. And he's in the top three every month. So he starts in the wash bay, enthusiastic, grow him to, I think, 12x. 12x his starting salary in 18 months. Incredible. Wow. So why wouldn't you pay a person that, I mean, his 12x, these salaries, probably 20x the company's income from the input that he, so he, he wins, his family wins, the company, everybody wins. Mm. Now, you're right, like who are these people that I have to pay my domestic worker? Do, does that person add value? And do you teach that person to add more value so that they can earn more? It's, it, you have to give people purpose. You can't just put them there. We in South Africa, we need to understand our responsibility. Um, towards our fellow South Africans. Yes. It's as simple as that. If you look at what's happening and how many people currently are living under the poverty line, and we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing with our wealth? Like, where is it going? Yeah. And how are we um, using our wealth to empower more people? Yeah. That's, the, that's a quality question right there, sir. You had to, what do you know? Are we just sitting on top of it? Or are we going, what can I do with no. this money? Are we stacking it we just uh, because know. it's there? Are we taking it overseas? Or what are we doing with it? I can it with me. How many gold watches can you own? How yeah. many, many supercars can you drive? Yeah. And, you know, if you leave this earth, what is your legacy? Yeah. What, did, what did you do yeah. to improve the lives of the people around you? Because that's the ultimate truth. That's yeah. the truth. Bob. That's the truth. What are you doing? What have you done with your time 
to improve the lives of the people around you. Yeah. Amen. Amen Simple to that, yeah. as that. Like one, one of the things that's touched me the most is a Dale Carnegie, um, you know, legacy that he left. And, and it says, here lies a man um, that has empowered many men greater than him. Mm. So, gra he, I, I mean, he was, he was the ultimate visionary businessman. But he said, all these people that work for me, with me, are better than me. The, the, the thing that he could do the best is synergize everybody. Mm. There's a better accountant than I am. There's a better sales leader than I am. There's a better, uh, you know, Incredible. retention person than I am. But, but I'm a synergist. Mm. I bring all these great people together and together we can take over the world. Mm. So, you know, if I, look, if I look back, the happiest I've... And I, you know, you always ask yourself, when were you at your happiest? When were you... What, 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 what time in your life were you going now? Now I'm content. And to me, it was the years when I, I took over uh, Tux FM, the radio station. So I wanted to ask you, mm. so how does that 17-year-old man, young man, you're still a young man. So how does that 17-year-old young man, you know, progress into the, into the, into the position that you are now? Like okay. explain to us, how did, was Tux FM the first jump into radio? How does that happen? I always, I always say to um to the people closest to me, you need to understand there's always two or three people in your life somewhere that that took an interest. And it takes a village to raise a man. <laughs> that saw something in you and, and they just gave you that, that leg up. And to me, those people were in my life. They, they are people in your life that enter your life for a reason. Um, but uh, that aside for the moment, um, ironic how things work out in the the greatest scheme of things. But because I wanted to be a politician, I said to myself, okay, the moment I get to university, I'm going to start my political party. I don't like what there's, what's out there, but I'm going to start a political party. Beautiful. So, ironically enough, in about the first week when I was at university, I did a speech on the, on the big lawn there in front of the Marinsky Library. And obviously there was no one to attend. It was just me. Um, and I remember walking, I used, used to carry a briefcase, a <laughs> very, you know, serious. Um, serious Afrikaans boy. I remember walking back to my, I was driving a Mini at the time. A Mini? Uh, uh, a Lambor Mini. How do you fit in a Mini? You're uh, like six yeah. foot tall. <laughs> yeah, that's a story for another okay. day, Bobby. But anyway, so I bought this Mini with, I used to work in a video shop. And with the money I made there, I bought this Mini because this was the only way I could get to university. Anyway, so I'm walking back to my mini and I pass this house in Duxbury. And it says, uh, you know, a little sign that says Radio Tux, Radio Tux. And there's a sign outside the door that says looking for, uh, present, uh, looking for DJs, newsreaders, music compilers, um, and something else. You walk past the sign. Yeah. So I thought, wow, this is fantastic. On your way back from a political rally... With your briefcase for, for one, you walk past the sign. And, okay. So I walk past the sign and I think, what better way to get my message out? I'm going to be on the radio. And I walked in and I said, I want to be a DJ. My Afrikaans, ek wille omrooper wees. You know, I'm we Afrikaans. So they said, okay, well, let's do a voice test. And I sat down. Uh, very seriously, I, I think I announced uh, Michael Jackson's Black or White. Yeah, I, okay. Yeah, that was the track. Yeah. I said, uh, Volgende, Michael Jackson met Black or White. So the guy looked at me and he said, oh, you've got a good voice. Yeah, I think we'll appoint you. Right so, there and there. So I thought, fantastic. <laughs> I'm going to be a DJ. So <laughs> ironically enough... Um, how old are you here? Yeah? Like 18, 18 19? 18, 18, 18, yeah. 18 years old. Okay. Awesome. So, very ironically enough, uh, because I was immediately then, because I was a DJ, I was exposed to, for some reason, that particular organization attracted all the, like, the eccentrics on campus. Okay. The, all the, the lonely kids okay. sort of ended up there. Okay. You know, for some reason. Um and when I was exposed to them and their new ideas and how they thought about stuff, and I realized... This is my click. I'm not an island. <laughs> um, I started changing. I remember I never had a drink in my life before. Up to that point. Up never. to that point. 
Um, <laughs> and I was looking at these... Here comes a nice story out there. Yeah, I, I, was, I was looking at these kids, and like they're all smoking and drinking. I'm like, what the hell what kind of people are these? <laughs> so they had a, th a thing called a chukoto, which was a thing they would buy. It was like a marula beer. Okay. They would buy just the opposite in the, at the uh, cafeteria. They always come in there with their two liters of chocotto. Alcoholic drink? Yeah. Two liters? Yeah. Okay, that makes for a good show. Um, so I, I remember I had a few sips of that and I thought, wow, this is a, this is a good feeling. <laughs> and then I realized they have these parties. Then they would have a scalp braai like once every few months, and then they would get completely wasted. Lots of, lots of two liter bottles yeah. floating around. And, and they were sponsored by, I remember, Winston and Black Label. And there was always free stuff. So because thought, you had to punt that on the radio. Yeah, yeah, you know, it was free for all back in the day. <laughs> so uh, I remember, yes, and I, I thought, this is actually, I quite like this. You know, and now I have friends and, you know, I like this feeling I get from the yeah. Jakarta and the Black Label. So somehow, because I'm exposed to these different ideas, I started changing. And within a few, I would say about a year, um, I realized that somehow I, I'm different. And ironically enough, there were literally, I think at the time, about four black students okay. at Tux. And um, I remember uh, one of those guys came to Tux. Um, I was appointed then as a DJ, head of DJs in about a year's time. Okay, great. And... Uh, and I remember he then came for an audition. So I then appointed the very first black DJ. Awesome. At Radio Tux. Awesome. First time, Rodney Mabua was his name. Rodney Mabua. So uh, he started then also, you know, his ideas and how he thought and he exposed me to um, house and uh, uh, all sorts of new music styles that I didn't so know. Th th there's a lot of flavor that, that, yeah. that, that's now being injected and... It, it, Awesome. And then my lecturers, um, who were two of them very progressive people, um, uh, Rechtsphilosophie, Legal Philosophy, and uh, Rechtsgeschiedenis, History of Law. And the one of the lecturers is now, he was a constitutional court judge for many, many years. Wow. And um, I mean, these liberal guys, yes. and how they, uh, and uh, how we were talking about justice and um, uh, uh, that we need a constitution and that we need, you know, human rights sh should be enshrined in it. And suddenly, I, I never knew there was such a thing. Human rights? What, what's that? So I was exposed to these very liberal um, professors and lecturers, uh, exposed to different cultures at the radio station, um, approached to different viewpoints from these eccentric characters that were hanging around. It was all part of my growth. That's awesome. And, and you, you know, people take that for granted today. You can, you, you take out your phone, you open Facebook, and you can have a look at a, uh, you, you, you know, a Latina festival versus, a, a, you know, a quieter festival. Th this wasn't mm. possible back then. You, you, you needed to physically meet someone, have a conversation, yeah. be open-minded enough to say, okay, that's quite cool. Let me try this, this or whatever it is. Mm. And, and, you know, you... You add value to your own life and you open your eyes because you're no longer doing this the whole time. You actually look around you. So you need to understand where I was when I joined the yes. radio station. I was extremely conservative. Yes. I mean, I told them when Andri Strianich, the leader of the Conservative Party, and I attended many of his speeches because I liked his, his skill as an orator. Okay. I actually went to see how he did it, how yes. he spoke, how he got the crowd to support him. But I, I looked at Andres Trianich, um, uh, you know, as an, almost like an, uh, an inspiration to be a yes. better orator. Yes. But anyway, so when Andres Trianich died, I told them at Radio Tux, you know, I, I, I'm too emotional. I can't do my show today. So give me, just give me two or three days to get over this. Yeah. Now that's where Process I was. It. Understand. That's where I was. Versus being exposed to Versus, all this other... I mean, I went completely, um, uh, you know, 180 degrees from there. And... Um, changed my entire way of looking at things and thinking about things and understanding that if you're not exposed to different ideas, you will not grow as an individual. Opposing no opinions. Way. Opposing yeah. opinions. You think this is right. You think this is right. Let's have a respectful debate, a conversation. Let's come out mm. to the truth. And ironically enough, then, as I became more liberal, um, we started doing a, a late night show. 
You know, it's, uh, like I say, all of these things that happen in your life get you where you need to be. Yes. So we, uh, a friend of mine, Vit Blitz, was doing Vit Blitz. The, was doing <laughs> That's the, a cool DJ name. Yeah. He was getting doing, the party started. <laughs> he was doing the late show, 10 to 1. Vit and, Blitz, uh, I love it. So I was waiting for him to finish because we were going to go out drinking or something that night. And uh, <laughs> he came out. I, there was a lounge outside the studio and he came out. He said, listen, um, I was going to do this feature tonight, but you know, I, I couldn't find the records. Why don't you come in and then we just have a conversation. We just talk about stuff. Stuff, okay. Uh, I said, okay, I'm going to go. Uh, let's, let's do it. Let's just talk about things. And I remember the first thing, uh, it's just talking shit, you know. I said to him, okay, the, we sat down and I said, I wonder how hedgehogs give birth. It must be a very unpleasant experience for, <laughs> for both parties, the, the baby and the... So we started talking, that was the first thing we started talking about. And we, it just became more, con uh, you know, every night we did the show. It became more and more um, contra controversial. Yes. You know. Yes. We, as we spoke about thing, I, I think the things that I thought everyone was talking about was doing, but yep. no one was talking about, like yep. masturbation. Yes. We had a whole discussion about it. Yes. But anyway, so about a week, two weeks in, he said to me, his father was the dean, one of the deans at the university, and he said to my father, now I had a conversation with me, and he said we should stop the show <laughs> because it's listen, you know, it's, yeah, it's jelle praat veel goed en controversie jelle goed, so we shouldn't. So I remember then one night there was there was two rag committees. The one was a normal rag, and then there was Christ Yule. It was very Christian, you know, by a geloofige groepie, and they thought they can't associate themselves with rag because yes. of the drinking and yes, and the, the fornication. And, 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 and. So they did their own rag. But anyway, so so we're doing the show one night. Oh, by the way, it was called Heichel Met Hasim. Now Heichel means you know talking crap, lying with Hasim. That was okay. the show. Okay. Met Hasim. Okay. So we're sitting there, and suddenly a, a combi stops, and and out pops ten or twelve guys, students with baseball bats and, uh, um, you know, like golf clubs. Um, and I, I looked at him, I, I said, they're going to come and beat us the hell up now, <laughs> this group. So he says to me, well, you know, I remember his words. He said, well, yeah, I, have, I have to do the show now. So maybe can you handle it? Yeah, yeah I'm quite busy, but you, you, are, fit for, yes. you are fit for this fight. <laughs> So anyway, so I I've remember, got a couple of friends like that. As I remember well. <laughs> walking out that studio and the door closing behind me, and there was like a hallway. Here they come, you know, like this, <laughs> like a, this marauding horde. And you're you know, alone, walking It's just me, them. and they've got like cricket bats, and I'm like, oh crap! They're not here for practice. It's dark. So they, they run up straight to me, and the, the front guy says to me, the guy in front, he says to me. You think the things you've been saying. We are members of Christ, you all. Okay. I'm like, w w sorry, how do you, you the Christian group, like, with your bats and your stuff. Let's have a conversation. So he says to me, no, no, you, you, we, we're here to stop you, stop the show. So I, th I said to him, listen, um, guys, good news. I know you don't drink, but I've got Chocotto. You have to try this stuff. It's very light. So we sat down. And we had a conversation. And I said to him, I explained to him. I said to him, and then I realized in my mind, I said to him that I, you guys know, like, this is just humor. No one's yes. going to die. Yes. I'm, I'm not against your religion. Uh, I didn't insult anyone. It's just humor. It's just fun. It's my opinion, and we're having fun. Yeah. So in that moment, I realized that um, this is my calling. I will, I, I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing and that the fact that there was this amazing kick it was the weirdest kick I got you know seeing them so offended that they all you know leave their girlfriends get in a combi and come to the studio it was a kick to me you got a, you got a proper response anyway so we said so afterwards and I, I loved how um, they they all took their bats afterwards and they said well thank you for explaining to us why you do what you do um, we now we're now listeners. We'll listen again tomorrow. Have Beautiful. Good night. And they left. And I thought, okay, the power of conversation, just explaining. But also, I remember the kick. Just shaking the cage. Just waking people up. Just going against the grain. 
was just such a thing. And then we intentionally try to be controversial. Yes, because it, it gets an opinion now. It gets I a reaction. It. it gets a reaction. More people was li were listening. Yes. I realized I'm getting more listeners. That's what's happening. You're getting people that like you and that don't like you. I loved but it. but you, you've got the platform and it's growing. So I remember the first time I was, um, I was fired at uh, Pint uh, Radio. Pint was like a talk radio station. They appointed me because of my show at Tux. They said, no, you can come and uh, broadcast on Saturday nights between 10 and 12. You come can... and stir the pot. <laughs> Let's see what's happening. <laughs> and granted the guy, and once again, people that come into your life, the guy that told them about me was Frank Opperman, who uh, was obviously the famous Frank Opperman. He, he told them. He listened to me. And he said to the, the, the guy who started Pint, he said, you need to get this guy. Yeah. So they said, okay, 10 to 12, you can do what you want on Saturday nights. 10 to 12, Saturday night. Yeah. And boy, did we have fun. <laughs> How did you get fired there? <laughs> I, was, I was suspended a few times. <laughs> but uh, uh, we were talking about the, um, you know, it's just like things that at that point in time I was thinking about and that bothered me. And you brought that up. So, we, so for instance, the one night we, we spoke about... Um, like the Bedouins, you know, the Bedouins that travel through the desert. Yeah. And I, I, I said to them, like, you know, if you look at uh, Luz, for instance, you know, you've got male for the males, for the females. But like, if you're a Bedouin woman, what do you do? How do you do your business yeah. now? Yeah. Like, <laughs> in the middle of the desert, like, what do you do? So I then actually researched it and then found that there's a way in which there's Bedouin a women do it using two fingers. So um, <laughs> I, had, I had my, uh, my technical, my Natasha Marchetti, she was my technical producer, so I said, Natasha, so I'm not going to ask you, I'm going to bring you into the studio, and we're going to demonstrate how Bedouin women we. So you're going to sit there, and we're going to have a, a <laughs> bottle of energy with water in it and a bucket. So, uh, so I said, to, okay, Natasha, so we're going to demonstrate. We're gonna, let's, let's see how this works. And Natasha's game, she's like, she's okay, game. let's go. <laughs> but obviously, it's theater of the imagination. Years before there were cameras, cameras in the studio. Okay, Natasha, so drop your pants. So we went through the whole Bedouin. The so whole process, the, then you the whole business. Open this and then that. Okay, so <laughs> Natasha, are you ready to wee? She said, I'm ready. I'm Bedouin ready. She said, and I... I signaled to her and she squeezed the energy <laughs> bottle. And you just heard this on the air. <laughs> this stream of water going into the bucket. <laughs> yes, and I looked at those lines and they all just lit up. Everything was, everything was ringing. Every phone was ringing. And uh, the this, uh, production manager came in and he said to me, so I guess that's a holiday for you then. <laughs> See you in a month. <laughs> See you in a month. Like, okay, cool. So anyway, so, um, so I went home <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, it's, it's a month without pay. So I thought I can at least get something out of this. So I phoned the Pretoria News. I said to them, you won't believe what I heard on the radio last night. I was, I was uh, just, you know, knitting something when I, I had the radio on print. And I heard this man talking about Bedouin woman. I'm deeply, deeply offended by this. And I said, what's your name, sir? And I said, Stephen from Sunnyside. Yeah. Um, please, you have to do something about this. It's just shocking. But then they write a whole story. They put it on the front page. Beautiful. Said this, More exposure. Yeah, they said this guy phoned us. And they, you know, yes, no, Rian van Jeren, who's this guy now who was fired? So I, I was the guy that phoned the, the newspaper the first time. And complained about myself. Beautiful. Because that's creating controversy around yourself. Like, yeah. I, made, I made this happen. So only X amount of people that on the lines yeah. heard it. Let's get more people to know about yeah. this. Beautiful. So the nice Beautiful. thing was, then after that, I, I actually got my, my very first death threat as well, which is always exciting. People phone you. Has there been more than one? Yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, people phone you. Oh, I'm gonna. I know where you live. I'm gonna come and kill you. Oh okay, well. Why would you phone me then yeah. if you want to kill yeah. me? Yeah. You, you know? You're giving me a heads up. <laughs> yeah. So I'm gonna leave town now. If it's your need to kill me, why don't you just kill me? Don't tell me about it. Then you know they're not serious. Yeah. Yes. But anyway, yes. so 
So I thought, yes, I love this. This is, this is just my, this is me. So um, the first time, every time it was intentional. And then, yes, there was a kick. There was a wonderful thrill that went along with it. Because every, after every time, you know, there was this debate. People were at least talking. People were discussing. People were talking about me. Um, and then, ironically enough, uh, later on, it was, it's, it was not intentional. Okay. But I, I got to a point where I said, I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to have an opinion. And I, I think my opinion is valid, just as valid as yours is. Absolutely. And uh, we just started saying what I think about things. And then completely unintentionally, I started getting in trouble. Okay. So uh, just because I was speaking my, my truth. Yes. So there was a time when I was a jacaranda when I um, had three BCCS hearings in one day. Three. So, three. So there was the breakfast, there was the early morning one, then lunchtime, then late afternoon. So every time it was me and the program manager, and then every time, and they had a legal guy there as well, a lawyer. And then the first group would come in and say, ah, you said this and this about that. And, that. and then the, you know, the, the, the panel had to hear, and then we had our uh, uh, representative, well, we, we said what we thought, and off they went. And then the next group came in. Three in one day. Three in one day, yeah. So the most, so I was fined, um, I th yes, and I need to remember how much I was fined. But I remember that was once was, the first time was about 25k. That's a lot of money. Yeah. No, no, but you know, I, I paid more in, in legal uh, cases. And, <laughs> Representation, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the th I was sued for 350,000 or something like that, years before that. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. You, you know, th this has become a, you said it was always intentional. Now it's, it's, it's an absolute, you are unconsciously just speaking your mind. So yeah. th there's, four, there's four layers. Let me, let me see if I can get it right the first time. So you are unconsciously incompetent in a subject. Then you find out about the subject. Then you are consciously incompetent. Then you are consciously competent so that means you know you know that okay i don't know much but if i follow this this recipe which you figured out because oak showed up there with bats and cricket bat and it wasn't practice time mm. now you're unconsciously competent in in creating opinion and i wouldn't say i, I wouldn't say controversy it's your truth it's not controversial but you unconsciously this is what i think about this so what mm. and then people say yeah oh, but i've got an opposing opinion cool come let's talk about it and then see what comes up. You see, the, the, the shows I do now is, it's, it's ironic how now finally you're at the place where you tried to be 20 years ago. But um, like whatever, and I see many times, even the people around me, they cringe. They're like, oh shit, he's going <laughs> to... He's going to do oh, it now. Damn. It's coming. <laughs> so, um, you know, whatever is happening around us, like with the Stratbrise that we do, we just... You know, we just I, talk about it. If you know? I could, if I could sit in in your shows, I'll be, I'll be the guy. There's a cool drink and popcorn. I'm like, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> so, the scenic drive at this point in time, it's, it's. You never know where it's heading, and it's very true. We don't know, we don't know what's going to come out and how the show is going to end. Anything can happen. So, to touch on your point, you know, we're doing now, what we should have been doing, twenty years ago. If you could go back twenty years and take. You've got obviously this wealth of knowledge and, and in different industries, you've had many experiences. What, what's the one thing that you could take back that would serve you better, you, you know, at the point where you started your career? Is there one mindset or one mind hack that you could take back with you and say, if I have to do this all again, this is the one thing I'll take back to start with, which I never had at that point. I, things happened exactly the way it was supposed to be. Love your answer. A, a, a few years ago, I thought, like for instance, you know, studies-wise, I thought, yes, maybe I should have not done law, but maybe I should have done psychology or something like that. But eventually, I did. I did a master's in psychology, and I was. I looked back and thought, ah, so I, I think I would have, would have made a horrific psychologist. <laughs> I, horrific. I, I don't think so. You or your, like. People have, 
I, I gauge it with temperatures. Some people's temperature in in their faith is extremely high. Some people's temperature in their income is extremely high. Your EQ, the way you read people, you read the room, the people in this room. I've never ever sat next to somebody that has EQ on that. You would have made a phenomenal psychologist. Oh, thank you, Bobby. You, but you really would have. The patience thing. You know, to me, when the thing with psychology that we learned was um, you have to have to listen to your story over and over because you've got the answers. I don't have the answers. So eventually you click. You go, okay, fuck, I've now listened to myself for 12 times. That, that's mm, it. Now I get it. But now my job is just to reflect the whole time as a psychologist. But that's not, uh, these days, my, I don't have a lot of patience. So I'll tell you immediately. Listen. Uh, listen, what the hell? Yeah, yeah. Why, why are you still with him? Or with her. Yes. Why? Why are you not seeing? And this is my curse, Bobby. Is I can see where you can be. Um, you know, I, I'm not a psychic, but I can. I can see. I can read your potential. So I can. I, I read your potential. I, I see very clearly where you can be, but you don't see it. Um, in most cases, people do not. They don't look to the towards themselves. So you are a psychic because speak to any one of my managers. If we have a confrontation, I take whatever's on my table. I take the two cups and I say, this is where I see your potential is. And I put it at the end of the table. Do you believe me that it's infinite? Yes. Why are you showing me this? And I put it at the beginning of the table. This gap here upsets me. That's why we're having this conversation. All I want to do is just push you here faster. Mm. That's the only thing I want to do. But that's all you can do is say... You're not living up to your potential. But most people cannot see it, Bobby. Yeah. That's, that's the curse. So they cannot look towards themselves. But he does, he wanted, someone said to me, and I'm trying to think of the reference now, but someone said that the problem that we've got is we always notice people around us and ignore the yeah. self. Yeah. It you don't, all starts here. You don't look towards yourself as well. I think the, the number one question that you should you should always answer is who do you want to be so so who do i want to be and and you know give yourself it's a trick that 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 a mentor of mine taught me give yourself three words so who do you want to be this is i've got a crystal clear picture of who i want to be three words are leader and able and kind you know that that's how i want to see myself there so this is the person i want to be three attributes are leader and able and kind so when I'm making a decision or when I'm making a business decision, chatting to somebody, am I a leader and enabler and am I kind? Mm. Because that's ultimately who I'm chasing. And if the answer is no, then I don't do it. If the answer is yes, then I have to do it. And people always say kind is, is the ultimate aggression. It's not, it, it's not weak. Kind is very strong if it's used correctly. Mm. It's used correctly. I don't, know if that, if, I don't know if that analogy made any sense, no, but that's, that's how much. I see it. Very much. Beautiful. I want to touch on, obviously, very successful. Everything you touch is successful. And to get there, you've made some mistakes, some landmines that you've stepped on, and poof, something happens, and you're like, sure, I didn't see that coming. Next time, I'm going to avoid this. If you can perhaps share some of the landmines that you've stepped on throughout your career, that taught you that we, we want to extract the golden thread for our interviews is always... Like learn from from the celebrities' lessons so that we can try to potentially avoid them. I think the very first thing is, um, and it's it's a cliche, but you have to surround yourself with people that know more than you. Beautiful. So that's the very first thing. The second thing, very very crucial, is um, you before you start any business that you don't know one hundred percent that you don't understand. You need to find the guy that's been the most successful in that business and spend as much as possible time with him or her. Crucial. You have to sit down with them and say, how did, how did you do it? How do you do it? Um, how do you? And then you need to have an open line with that person. So you can, when you're actually in the business, you can pick up the phone and say, listen, this is now, I've encountered this problem. How do you, how do you do it? How do you do it? So you need to have those two things. The people that work for you in the business need to know more than you, although you, are, you manage their skill. You're the synergist. So for instance, um, 
you know, at the restaurant as an example, like the, um, the, the cooks in the kitchen know a hell of a lot more than me about food. Preparation and execution and... They know a vast amount. They have a vast amount of knowledge. So I can... All I can do is taste the food and then say, I like it or I don't like it. I have no idea how they do it. Then I've got um, a guy, I've got guys that, you know, they control stock and I just make sure that we don't lose. So they, they know exactly how much to order at which point in time. Uh, what are we running short of? Uh, this need for money. I can need yeah. to do. They yeah. don't have the patience. But all of these people know more than me. So I just need to find the best people out there that, can work in those different departments, but there's no expectations that I need to know more than them. And I don't even go out and, and, you know, I know more than you. So I say to them, I'm good at, for instance, marketing. Yes. Um, You're good at cooking, you're good at stock, you're good at, so as a team, we work together. Champion. So ek weet wat ek kan goed doen, en ek weet wat jy kan goed doen. En dan, so dis die die een been daarvan, die ander been is that mentor. Van our is means uh, they know more than you. It's as simple as that. And they were successful in their field. And to have an open line to that person. I want to comment there. So I'm growing my company. We're growing. I'm aggressive. I'm training people. And I come across a person that, that's very calm. It's very placid. And I find out this, this, this specific person has 30,000 salespeople that work for him mm. in the US. 30,000. Mm. So how do I get him as a mentor? Because people watching will say, yeah, well, it's easy for you guys because you've got a bit of influence and you can go and reach out and people know who you are. It's easy for you to get a mentor. I'm, I don't have the audience that you do. So how do I do it? In a different continent that has 30,000 salespeople. Mm. What do I do? I get his email address and I write him a love letter. Yeah. I Amen. say to him, sir, I admire what you do. This has impacted my life. This has changed the way I, th- I view things. This, 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 yeah, this leadership hack has made me X amount of money. This has prevented somebody from resigning. I want to say thank you very much. And I want to ask you, if you ever have five minutes to chat, I would love to spend five minutes with you on a Zoom. Mm. It took three days. His PA called me, physically called me mm. from the US on a WhatsApp call and said, this gentleman is uh, willing to chat with you on Wednesday. That's how I got a guy that has 30,000 salespeople to speak to me. Yeah, exactly that. So I see, the thing is that we've realized, and you will now obviously give that back. You will pay it forward. So, so you you know, on that topic, there's a, there's, I did a a road show with AutoTrader just before COVID. And I spoke to about 80 dealers in KZN about 55 dealers in Cape Town and about three, 400 dealers in, in, in Santon. And two dealers in KZN reached out, you know, that we, we're selling 450 cars, they had about 40 cars. I've got moral authority over that number of sales. They reached out and the one I'm, I'm very proud of, he's, he's, he's headed towards 70 vehicles per month mm-hmm. and the other one's at 60. Excellent. He's more of a lifestyle, lifestyle kind of a business, but I, I know where to poke them and what areas to fix now. To, for them to, to, to grow that company. Excellent. Just like the gentleman knows what problems I'm experiencing at 67 salespeople because he's got 30,000 salespeople. You see, that's precisely that. Like, we pay it forward. And you, you now also understand that we all, when you get to a certain level, you feel like, you know, and it's your responsibility to give back, to share that knowledge and to help businesses that are still trying to get there. It's your responsibility. It, you can't hold on to that knowledge. Is. And and what it what it taught me is, with a with a beautiful American accent, he says, "Barbie, mm. yes sir, Barbie, says, Barbie." <laughs> I spend thirty percent of my time with people below my level, coaching them and training them. Other business people, thirty percent on my level, and thirty percent on people that are above me. I'm like, there's people above. He's like, oh man, I'm the smallest guy in the room. He's like, I am tiny compared to some of these oaks that I spend time with because they're teaching me stuff. I'm sharing with my platform that are on the same level and I'm bringing the people from, mm. from above me up. Mm. And I love that. So I, you know, fr- from a television point of view, I have <clears throat> these two p- 
powerful women um, that I have access to that are just masters at their craft. They just Beasts. yes, they I are love just that word. <laughs> they are just incredible. And um, at the very beginning, I, I said to them, you know, like I'm going to learn from you. Like I'm just um, I'm going to hear what you have to say, and I'm I'm just going to do what you say. It's as simple as that. And because you know more than me. That's the trick, though. I think everybody needs to get this. Mm. Because when somebody says, this is what worked for me, very few people will go and ex execute this. Like, oh, it worked for you. Will it work for me? Yes, it will. No, just it will work. Execute, just yeah. execute. They've got the moral authority. They know what they're talking about. That's why you're seeking yeah. counsel. Yeah. And th the thing is, when I implemented what they said, I could see the change in the product. So every time... You know, it's, it's simple. Um, if, I have, if I'm not sure, like I said, the open line is crucial. Um, but I'm not sure, should I, shouldn't I? You know, I pick up a phone, I phone, and I say, what do you, what do you guys think? Or, um, and the advice is always spot on. So the third, the, that's the two things. The third thing, and I need to point this out because it's, it's, a very, it's a very important one. The power of words. The power of words can never be underestimated. So if you want to, the concept of power resides in words think of any speech that has ever been given and the impact it has had on the one person that heard it and how that has then then impacted many other people it starts with words not only the words that you speak but the words that you speak internally so inward and outward inward and outward and it starts with inward because there's a warrior inside yeah. you you can't you can't feed the warrior negativity. You have to feed him positivity. Yeah. So the power of words. I cannot stress that enough. So I, I love studying public speakers. Um, for, for me, personally, I think Barack Obama was one of the strongest public speakers that, that I've ever seen. Matthew McConaughey, brilliant as well. He's a brilliant storyteller. Lovely book, Green Lights. I don't know if mm. you've ever... I know about it, yeah. Beautiful book. But, but uh, uh, the power of words. Barack Obama shows up. He's not loved in that state. So, so he says, you know, in this stadium with the best American accent, you know, we are not Republicans and Democrats. We are Americans. We are not this group and this group. We are Americans. We are not this and this. And he just mentions the division. We are Americans. So for the next two, three minutes, the whole stadium is quiet. And then you see this whole eruption. The power of words. It makes perfect sense to mm. me. Mm. Beautiful. Now, if you could spend a single day, a whole day, with anybody, dead or alive, who would it be and why? I would say Churchill. Winston Churchill. Mm, definitely. Why? We're back to the power of words now again. And it was yes. interesting to me how the big speech, the we shall fight on the, yes. on the beaches and the skies, it was, was given in Parliament. We all thought it was a radio broadcast, but it wasn't. Was it not a radio broadcast? Apparently it was in Parliament. I always thought it's a, it's a radio broadcast. If it was given in, in Parliament, that, that means it's more powerful than I even thought it was. Yeah, yeah. so that was... I think later on it was broadcast, you know, as a, as a thing. Yes. But um, the way I understand it, and like, like uh, you know, I'm willing to be corrected on this one. It was, it was a speech that was given and had then an impact that became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But more than that, I love the way that he understood um, how very early on he understood the risk. Yes. And very early on he was able to come up with a plan or a strategy when um, everyone was going, oh, crap, you know, the, every, the world, whole world is going to go up in flames. He was able to, to, to see how the, where the solution was to be found. So no, a profound man. Sequencing, sequencing was on point. Mm. Uh, I must say, the other guy would be Jan Smits, General okay. Jan Smits, which, which was probably one of the top five most brilliant people to ever walk 
the South African soil. Gunsmith's was brilliant. Beautiful. Um, and ask him just that one question, how do we fix the current situation? Yeah, because those, those two people will understand the, 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 the sequencing effect. Mm. They, they can almost, a brilliant leader sees around the corner. Yeah, knows what's exactly, coming. You can exactly. see around the corner. Because if you, if you course correct one millimeter here, you're going to end up, the distances are big. And, mm -hmm. and visionaries know yeah. how to measure that and anticipate mm. this. He understood that. Beautiful. Now, a weird question. Mm. If you could be a fly on the wall in any room, like what room would you want to be a fly on the wall on? And what's the conversation and who's in the room? What would you like to hear if you are not allowed to hear that conversation? Like who's in the room and what are they talking about? Mm. That's a weird question. <laughs> I know. I think a, a cabinet, Lechotla. Um, on the Saturday night after everyone had a few drinks. Okay, just to hear what's going on yeah. there and the type of conversation yeah. that's going on there. Okay, Definitely. awesome, awesome. <laughs> we know your first car was a Mini, is that, is that correct? That's yeah. the first car you bought yourself. So we know it's a Mini. I don't know how you drove in it. Maybe, you know, you had a plan of a, a, a sequencing of how you sat in it. <laughs> it was a mess. <laughs> mess. But what's your dream car? Um... The the best car I ever drove was the was that um, four four five eight Ferrari four five eight Italia yeah wow that was the best car I ever drove beautiful I I didn't get it before I drove that car I honestly didn't understand until I drove that car okay. it was just ah oh, yes that's your dream car yeah oh heavens so, like I said it's got nothing to do with ooh I want to show off it's just Driving that thing. A masterpiece. Yes. I hope you get one in each color they make it in. So that's what I hope <laughs> yes. for you. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. Mm. You're, a, you're a big reader. Mm. Our company has a culture that was initially very enforced by myself. Everybody in our company reads a book a month, writes a report, mm. and hands it to me. I read every report, and I give feedback, and we discuss the book as a company. It's a thing that we've been doing. It's almost two years now and it's grown our company culture and it's, it's, it's created this hunger for learning, which I absolutely love. So it started as a, you will read a book a month to like, what's the next book? I've got half the company on the 10th already is like, cool book. There's my review. Love. These are my three takeaways. What's the next book? Yeah. So, so that, that's our culture. And you, you, you just touched on it. You're a big reader. What's your favorite book? A big reader that has like 20, but what's your favorite, like the ultimate book? A Catcher in the Rye. A Catcher in the Rye. Yeah. So now, that book obviously inspired someone to shoot John Lennon. Holy moly. But um, I read it and I thought, there's like 700 underlying themes here that needs to be unpacked. I don't think a tenth of a catcher in the rye has been unpacked yet. Beautiful. We're going to put a link. I've never, ever done that book. I'm going to do it today. I'm going to start it today. I'm going to put a link on the screen so that uh, interested people can go and download. Is it available on Audible? You should be, yeah. Audible? Okay, cool. Or you just can order it from Take A Lot, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Awesome. Now, what's coming up next? Like, <laughs> where can people see you? Where can people come and greet you? Your restaurant... Like, what's going on in your life going forward? We are on our way now to Los Angeles for a show we're doing called Tarzan Fun George. Tarzan Fun George. Yeah, it's about a guy that thinks he is the, going to be the next Hollywood Tarzan. So we're taking him to Hollywood. Beautiful. Um, what an opportunity. Credible story. 12 well years now, he's been trying to become the next Hollywood Tarzan. So he makes little videos on YouTube trying to inspire people. You know, to, he, he wants to be seen. So I didn't get it, to tell you the honest truth, until I, I went to... Uh, first, we, you know, he, he's making a movie. We made a movie, a short film, to showcase his talents to Hollywood. So we, we were part of that process. We filmed him filming his movie. Okay. Um, and I, the dedication was uh, mind-blowing. And then we went to where he comes from, from George. And I literally took him to the jungle, 
<laughs> if I can put it like that, the, the, the jungle of George. George's jungle. It's beautiful, beautiful planet there. And um, when he was there, he was Tarzan. Amazing. Um, it's difficult to explain, but I saw Tarzan in front of me. Awesome. So now we're taking him to Hollywood. So we're doing that. Then there's a few other TV shows lined up. Please share, please. Um, can't. If you, okay, not allowed to yet. Okay, okay. And then... That's um, exciting. We're probably doing another few series of uh, Vivorte Millionaire. I think that's coming up. Can't wait. Yeah. So, uh, and then, yeah, the restaurant's going from strength to strength. So, so the, you know, that's currently a, a place where we're experimenting with all new types of concepts and new things. And we're making this thing called the Mammoth now, which I, I'm taking everyone back to caveman days with like this proper uh, beef rub with this chunk of meat on it. Nice. So, yeah. Um, so, a lot of, lot of fun things still waiting. So, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Not only a brilliant entrepreneur, a presenter, loving father, a thought leader, but a massive, massive gentleman. Thank you very much for joining us. I had lots of fun. I've learned lots. I've learned a lot about you. A very interesting life and uh, many, many big things to come. I think you're just getting started so in your business career. Wow. All the best going forward. Thank you, Bobby, and congratulations with your success and your wonderful business. Thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you for being here. Looking forward to your next steps. So thank you for a wonderful conversation. Thank you, sir.